good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for being here today. It's a great honor to be here. Um, when I just uh, joined the UMS, I was asked by my former manager uh, to write a book about the medicinal plants of Salah uh, two years ago. Um, and then I've been working daily on that for about eight hours and gathering all available information. And I came out with this uh, manuscript, uh, which is now with the publisher. It will be published hopefully in June in the US uh, CRC Press. I have published around uh, 15 books so far on the topic of medicinal plants of Asia. So that's why I'm in this part of the world. I have a passion for these plants. Hey, thank you very much. Um, Shall we start? Yes, we can start. <coughs> I'm not sure why this picture came up, but let's get okay. It's nice. <laughs> so, um, let us speak a little bit of a fascinating subject. Really, um, Sabah is, um, I can say, after years of research, two years actually, ended up with um, extraordinary flora. Um, and I would like to speak about this medicine of flora to raise the community. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the Sabah Society for giving me the opportunity to speak about the medicinal plants of Sabah before you visit me. Thank you very much again. I try to use this thing. Um, so this talk uh, is supposed to be about uh, 45 minutes. And followed. Oh, you are here, Karim. <laughs> nice to see you. Thank you very much for coming. Um, and. Um, I hope it won't be too much academic, um, and I tried to, to make it. My main intention is to convey some key points about the medicinal flora of Sabah, and the lecture will be organized into um, seven parts. Sabah, one of the most interesting things I've seen about Sabah is that compared to Peninsula Malaysia and other Southeast Asian countries, We've got here we have quite a large number of various ethnic groups with different histories <coughs> and various languages. It is quite interesting. Mm, you don't find this in other countries. So it's a unique <coughs> thing about Sabah. So it's, it's, in the tradition, we speak about the various uh, things I've done to get the knowledge. Um, the second point will be a taxonomic uh, distribution. If you want to understand <coughs> the pharmacological mode of action of plants, you also need to understand about their botanical classifications. Some plants can belong to families which are known to be producing poisons, for instance. Other plants uh, other families of plants are known to produce certain types of compound. The plants that you see every day in your garden or in the forest are just not random. They are classified into families, um, orders, and species. It is extremely well organized. There is a logic. So I will have to speak about the taxonomical distribution. I will then speak about the various diseases treated uh, with these medicinal plants. It's quite tricky because sometimes in the villages people don't know about blood pressure. For instance, I will say I've got a pain in the back of my, of my neck. You know, the, the work of an entopharmacologist requires um, anthropological knowledge, um, pharmacy knowledge, botanical knowledge. It's not as simple as it seems. Uh, I will speak then about the various ethnic groups and plants used, for instance, the Dusuns, the Kadazans, which, according to published literature, are the, um, the older ethnic groups in this land, are using, for instance, more endemic plants than the Bajaos or the Iranums. 
So you see, there is a very deep relationship between human beings and plants. Mm. By knowing the, the groups, we will be able to appreciate the plants. Um, and then when we look into the side effects, I'm a pharmacist, I also hold a, a PhD, and mm, plants can be very poisonous. Uh, even some of the plants that you are um, actually uh, looking at on TV and advertisements, some of them are actually not safe. I will look about, I will, I will speak about the side effects. Then we look into the therapeutic applications. The fact is that Saba is blessed with a truly amazing medicinal flora, but to put it in some polite words, you are not doing much with that. You are importing a lot of drugs, but I'm telling you that you've got really fantastic plants in this part of the world, and we discuss about this hopefully. And later we discuss about the future prospects and the conclusion. Let us go into the introduction. Um, as a general introduction, we could say that we are all trying to live longer, um, at least those of us who are health conscious. We try not to smoke, um, we try not to eat greasy food. Some of us, some people don't really care about their health, but I do, and other people don't want to live long, because death is not pleasant. I don't think so. I don't want to know anyway. But uh, not now. Uh, so, life, being alive, is a miracle. A heartbeat, physiologically speaking, and at the cellular level, is a biological miracle. Breathing is a miracle. Walking is a miracle. Life itself. No one knows what is life. Not a single scientist can tell you what is life. It is a miracle, and now in this time in history, we have at our disposition, at least for those who can afford it, a medical system and a cornucopia of medicines to treat diseases. Okay, you've got high blood pressure, you go and see a doctor, you give you developers. It's okay. You've got a tooth infection, you will see a dentist. You get your tooth removed or get a canal. But you know, if it was about even 60 years ago, you'll die. We've got now all the drugs to live longer. It's great. However, cardiovascular diseases and cancers and other macular infections still cause the life of too many. So, it suggests that resorting to mother medication alone might not be enough. In terms of microbial infections, a striking example is the COVID epidemic. Of course, we all remember these difficult years. In suddenly on TV, they told us to stay at home with a mask and then you get your injections. But I recall that we were not protected with any drugs for almost a year. There was no drug for COVID at the beginning, right? So all of those drugs in hospitals could not treat COVID. And in these times, millions of people desperately were rushing to alternative medicines and some of them were rushing and using onions for COVID. Okay, why not? It's okay. We can, not too much, though. Um, turmeric. And some people were using black tea, including myself. But do you know that in Sabah, there is one plant that has been successfully used for COVID? And we'll go back into 
later orphanage is a traditional Chinese medicine. So you didn't know that, right? So at least I'm not wasting my time to try to give you more information. My dear friends, we need to understand that COVID-19 is not the last uh, surprise pandemic. I don't want to be a prophet of doom. I don't want to you to come back home with anxiety and panic attacks. No, it's not what I'm trying to do. But I also, as a professional pharmacist from France, it is my duty to tell you the facts in order to save lives. Um, COVID-19 is not the last surprise viral pandemic because we are still cutting primary rainforest. You know, nature and life itself is a matrix. It is like a machine. And if you push too much on nature, you are going to get a negative feedback loop to push on humans to ask them to cool down. And COVID is the one, but we are still cutting the forest, right? And we are still, you know, having all of these chickens in the farms by millions, and we are still disrespecting life. And I'm telling you that we are just citizens, we're not deciders. I don't want to be decider, but if people on the top are keep on, you know, doing that, then we've got to be ready for difficult times. So, deforestation and pressure on animals do not appear. Do you know what is a zoonosis, zoonotic disease? Yes, ma'am, you are saying yes, can you please tell me? It's a disease uh, that's transferred by animals. Very good, yes. It is basically a, a virus, for instance, transmitted from a rat or a pig or an animal, okay, whatever. Um, and this virus is not dangerous for the animal, but will kill a human. So when you go to a forest and go and cut trees deep, one day you are going to meet a species of rat that carries a virus that is going to kill millions of people in six months. Do you know about syphilis? Treponema pallidum, bacteria, which has killed millions of Europeans. It was an STD. Death by syphilis was one of the most horrible in history. People were just rotten in life with their, their, with their members falling off. Okay? Um, now we've got penicillin G. Okay? Um, so, we are not stopping pressure on the environment, and this is not barring a miracle. Hopefully, one day people will stop abusing nature. And in, the next, in all probability, the next viral pandemic will be, I really, my dear friends, hope not, but if that comes out, then the world, as you know, will end. Because you've got viruses that one comes from, I think, I forget, some apes or rats. HIV actually is a zoonotic disease. Uh, if we got something like a virus, uh, it's not the mask will be used, useless, and after three days, millions of people will die, like flies. Uh, what I say may sound excessive, but it is my responsibility to warn you that we are going that way at full speed. Because our leaders and masters, whatever you call them, and I wish them all the best, I don't know the politics, are still ordering deforestation and all of these violations in the environment. They can, but I hope they will be able to protect us. Uh, you've got here, for instance, a mortality rate of about 90% with dreadful hemorrhages. Okay, so the conclusion of this is that we need drugs more than ever. Now, imagine that with all the plants we've got in Sabah and also in developing countries, if you had already developed your medicines from your traditional medicines, you could have probably been able to save your population. You could have developed teas or other preparations that would help you to to withstand, you know, these pandemics. You need to understand that COVID is not the latest surprise pandemic, okay? So, where am I going the text? Uh, okay. And, of course, if you got this 
uh, there are going to be mixed populations, particularly those in the third world will be left at the mercy of deadly viruses, which we need to panic and panic unrest. What I say may seem excessive, but it is based on published. You just go to Google Scholar, and then you type pandemics, viral, future, and you get that one. For these reasons, it is necessary to make medicinal plants available to the medical profession. Nowadays, the medical doctors don't know anything about herbs, and the pharmacists know, but if you remember many years ago, even, you know, for instance, in France and in Europe, in the Middle Age and Renaissance, medical doctors were having teaching in botany and teaching in, 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 in medical science. The two sciences have been, the, you know, uh, also because of geopolitical and you know we are living in a capitalist system. I'm not doing politics, I don't belong to any the political party, but now we live in a money making world, that's the way it is, it's okay, okay, why not? And and therefore the medical doctors must sell the drugs sold by the corporations. And in universities the lecturers must teach about those drugs. And that's the way the world is. And you can because you can save lives with children. But I feel that we are putting aside too much medicinal plants. You see, for instance, if you want to buy medicines now, herbal remedies, you go on Google, right? And you buy something online. How dangerous? How do you know what's prepared that medicine? Is it a qualified pharmacist? Is it an herbalist? What is his knowledge? So there is the need for that, uh, to get medical doctors and pharmacists uh, you know, aware of these plants. Uh, it should also be added that the food found in supermarket, you're wondering why people about food, I'm wondering why, fast food, nothing is bad, no, we all enjoy McDonald's, Burger King, it's okay sometimes, and the food in petrol stations, those foods are too often industrial and unhealthy. So let's go to the next slide. Sorry, I don't know what they do with these machines. Uh, so, too much salt, we eat too much salt. Too much sugar, dangerous preservatives, coloring agents, and pesticides, and too many vegetable oils. I hope I will not become very unpopular, but I have to speak the truth that is that vegetable oils containing palmitic acid, such as palm oil, okay? I don't want to offend the tycoon of palm oil industry, okay? but I, will be, I, will have, I have to state the, the truth that is, promote the development of cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, and cancer. I have noticed I've been living in Malaysia for 20 years, and compared to European countries, there are too many people suffering from high blood pressure and diabetes and obesity. And I tend to think that perhaps too much palmol is being consumed. And I don't blame because it's cheap, right? But it's dangerous. So people may say this guy is speaking nonsense, it's okay, I'm open to critics. But let us let us the truth be spoken in the light of publications. And if you go to Google Scholar and you type palmitic acid, which is the main saturated fatty acid in the fixed oil of the food of Elias kinensis or palm oil, it's full of palmitic acid, which is going to, for instance, make the insulin receptors resistant to insulin. And therefore, you will, if you keep on eating this fried uh, or even palm oil, and if you don't have a strong physical activity, and if you are not burning calories, then you are on your way for troubles. By the way, the best oil for me is olive oil, if you can afford it. And if you can't, you can take the oil produced by this, uh, what is the name of this, I forget, um, sunflower oil, avoid um, um, oil of coming from plants in the plastic acid family because the plastic acid can be dangerous for your heart. 
um, anyways, we just know that it chilled like oils. Um, so, not only COVID-19 and other pandemics are there, we need drugs for that, but also, this global food does not respect differences and ethnographic needs. For instance, in Asia now, we are all eating sausages for the breakfast, <laughs> right? But your ancestors were not eating sausages for breakfast. You are taking margarine. I don't blame you. I just look at facts. Okay? It's nice to eat sausage. It's good to have a good a European breakfast. But we must understand and accept that we have physiological differences. We have some. We are human beings. We are all the same, but our bodies are a bit different. When you expose an Asian person to uh, American breakfast every day and lots of milk and dairy, no. And if you impose to European to have mm, 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 dried fish and rice and chili every day, it's for secrets, all right? So we, we are now having a system in which globalization, I don't predict globalization, but we are all treated as one American citizen whereby we have differences, and differences are good because when people are different, they can address problem from the difference and solve problem together. So um, it is therefore necessary to something interesting that I notice is that there is a lot of fruits and vegetables used by uh, the Dusun and the Murus and the Rungus which are not known to the West, but which are used as vegetables here. Meaning to say that you may have in Sabah perhaps the opportunity to develop nutraceuticals, which are healthy food, medicine. We will go back into that perhaps later. To return to the subject of medicinal plant of Sabah, we can say that Asia, and I have been in this part of the world for 25 years, I'm happy in Asia, it's my home now, okay? It's one of the areas of the world where the number of medicinal plants is among the highest. So Asia says from what, Istanbul to uh, uh, Tokyo or uh, Beijing, okay? It's an enormous land surface. And it is the home to the largest number of medicinal plants. And I remind you that some of these plants have the greatest therapeutic utility in Europe. For instance, the Roman, you know the Roman uh, Empire, um, used already in the antique world, used to import plants from Asia. We tend to think that the antique world um, was uh, a bit, you know, uh, the Romans in one place, the Egyptians, no, actually you already had trade. You already had trade um, uh, thousands of years before Christ um, between Asia and uh, the Roman Empire, Greeks and Egyptians with Asia importing herbs. One of them is opium. Uh, so opium is uh, the wonderful substance from when we get morphine. Uh, morphine that is really, um, you know, a medicine that helps people which are suffering with terminal cancers and this is the only thing for them to feel better. It is from a plant. It is not an organic substance. It is a substance produced by the plant. Is it not obvious that the plants are able to produce molecules in a way much better than organic chemistry? You also have, oh yeah, the Romans were using it for opium for teriyak. I will not go into teriyak, but it's an old pharmaceutical term. It was basically a pure oil. Uh, teriyak actually has been used in France up to the 19th century um, in pharmacy. We also have benzoin, cinnamon, pepper, and gambier, um, and other examples of this. The study of oh, slide five, sorry. Uh, okay, so this is actually the why I was in Asia for these 20 years, and I spent my time to try to help patients to know more about their books um, that I've been writing with passion, you know. Um, each of us has a role in this world, um, and this is what I've done all of these years, hoping to help people to find medicines. The most latest one was published with CRC Press. All of them are published in most of the US, 
plans for aging, where I speak about the plans uh, you know, that we can make on our diet to live longer. Um, so, sorry. Um, okay, so is it slide six? Okay. So, um, at the start of my contract at VMS, I was asked to write the book on the medicinal plants of Saba. Okay, I accept that, it's interesting. Um, why not? Um, I didn't know anything about Saba. I still don't know everything. Um, I'm still learning. Um, and um, so, after two years of daily work, I was able to gather enough information to write the book. The book is completed. It is now with the publisher, and I will give copies to the society. Um, I'm also asked the president to write a preface for the book. Um, if I'm, um, so, the problem is that I knew nothing about Sabah. I had to start from scratch, and I learned a lot about Borneo, not Borneo, called Sabah by reading the excellent book of, uh, excellent book entitled, Among the, it's, it's very nice, it's online, you know, um, written, uh, published in uh, 1922. And this um, man, uh, British anthropologist, Ivo Huck Norman Evans, served as a colonial administrator in the Ten Pasuk and Twalan district from 1910 to 1911. And I read his book and I enjoy it so much. Um, between the line of this book, one can feel the deep love of this man, gentleman, intelligent and refined gentleman, for the Dusun people and the land of North Borneo. Many of these uh, British administrators were actually, you know, loving the land and where they were working and respecting it, you know. And if you, if you have time, you can open your laptop, you can find, you read, very nice, beautiful. And he writes about a mysterious plant feared by the Rusun, and we speak about this. <coughs> You would think that, in fact, that plant is used for magical rituals. Magic rituals. I noticed that in Sabah, compared to uh, Peninsula Malaysia and other countries, there is an enormous amount of plants used for magic rituals by the Dusuns and uh, the Muruts and the, what is it, the Rungus. Okay? Uh, I don't know anything about magic rituals. Mm, um, it may sound a bit unscientific to speak about magic rituals. However, you need to know that some plants that have been used for magic rituals in Europe, you know, are actually um, the source of drugs, for instance, Digitalis corporea, uh, which is the fox glove that we can see in our beautiful uh, you know, in France, in my country, in some I got, but Digitalis Poporia is deadly poisonous, so it's beautiful but poisonous. Um, and also Atropa Belladonna, these were plants used by the witches of the Middle Age. And from these plants, from Digitalis, you've got, digi you got Digitali, which is used for the heart. And from Atropa Belladonna, you've got Atropi. So I am only interested about magic plants in this part of the world because historically magic plants have the tendency to produce medicines. I also managed to glean information from local people I met in Kota Kinabalu. The rest was extensive reading of books, publications and reports on this subject from about the 15th century. When I look into the history of Sabah, I understand that uh, North Borneo and you've got some sultanates in Brunei and in, uh, um, in the Philippines. Um, I look into the history a little bit, but it's not the topic of tonight's uh, talk. Um, uh, let us go now into the taxonomical distribution. Okay, um, I'll try to make it simple because it's not an audience of botanists. Um, in fact, it's better for me to speak in front of people like you because botanists know everything, so there's no problem for them to. Uh, so I'm glad to tell you that about the taxonomical distribution. We can say that, and I say it um, with confidence because I've studied that for two years, the state of Sabah has a fascinating spectrum of medicinal plants. 
the countryside of Sabah, the Mount Kinabalu, the maritime coast, the tropical forest of Sabah are of incredible beauty and represent one of the most beautiful places in the world. I discovered with fascination a medicinal flora of incredible richness and listen of excellent pharmaceutical potential. You've got in Sabah enough plants to produce drugs and to export them. And this is not very terrible. You've got in Sabah plants right now in villages awaiting discovery. Treating diseases. Even working perhaps better than drugs. They are there. Okay? So I was about to identify about 535 species of plant. I think it's more than that. I, I have the gut feeling that you've got almost 2,000 species of medicinal plants in this state. Okay? And you've got uh, of it, you know, uh, one person, I mean, actually, you have five species of mosses, you've got 23 species of ferns, and you've got 500, and uh, you've got a small amount of pine trees, and all the rest are angiosperms, also known as flowering plants. When you look into the monocotyledon, you know what is a monocotyledon? Okay. Okay. okay, so put it simple. Um, flowering plants, the seed. If the seed is, can be cut into two, like a bean, it is dicotyledon. Yes. Latin, da, di, tu. If it is, for instance, like, you know, areca tissue, you know, or your uh, betel nut, right? It's monocotyledon. The seed cannot be cut into two. Okay, all right? Um, so, monocotyledons, you will see with me that the people, the native of Sabah, okay, and I englobe everyone there, okay, use mainly plants in the grass family and in the gingers. And you've got a little bit of palm trees, right, and a little bit of Arase, which are the Aram family. Now, I have observed that in Sabah, compared to other countries in the world, you are using a lot of grasses for medicinal purposes. I don't know why, perhaps because the Dusuns and Gadazans, look, I'm not an expert in anthropology, so I may speak things which are perhaps not correct. We can discuss about this after this speech. Tend to live under, you know, Mount um, Kitabalu, and, uh, you know, on the slopes of Mount Kitabalu. And that's why you, know, you have more the grass normally. Uh, uh, plants in altitude in tropical countries are similar to those in temperate countries because of temperature. Uh, next, we can look into the dicotyledon. Okay, slide nine. As for the angiosperms, the highest number of medicinal plant species are the spurge family or euphorbiaceae. Example of euphorbiaceae is Evea, you know, an Evea tree with the, the seed, the, you have a fruit made of three, um, okay, some capsules, okay. Then you've got, followed by the Madder family or Ubiaceae, it is the coffee family, the Mulberry family or Moraceae with 16 species, the dogban family or Apocinaceae, okay. So really, Aphobiaceae, Aphobiaceae, okay, Moraceae, right. I'm sorry, you may not really know what to speak about, but I'm sure that's the way it is, okay. Um, also, in the Aster family, Asteraceae, Mint family, and Vervain family, what I found interesting is that the Delaniaceae here, uh, as well as the Apocinaceae and the Moraceae are not quite big families, but yet are used quite a lot in Sabah, and this suggests some preferences of these plants. Let us look now into the main diseases treated across all 
uh, ethnic groups in Sabah, and we can see some patterns. Uh, we can observe that there is a preponderance of infectious disease, and here are basically all the um, infectious disease, microbial infections, including bacteria, virus, fungi, and parasites, and also um, so we can see that uh, most disease treated are actually disease related with microbial infections. Uh, and I have actually observed that there is a high frequency of use for fever and also postpartum and wounds and cuts which are conditions strongly linked to living in isolated rural areas. So mainly for infections, and next comes the second type of disease are the digestive system, and you can see with me that stomachache is on the first line, followed by diarrhea, um, bit of diabetes. Uh, for some reasons, I can't explain, it seems that a lot of plants are used here for gas, for flatulence. It's, I mean, it's strange, um, compared to other countries, uh, especially the Dusun, actually, Lots of plants for flatulence. That's the way it is. I can't explain that, but it's like that. Okay. Um, and this stomachic uh, anteria could be due to the consumption of unclean food and unsanitary water. Slide 12. We have now here. So, okay. Another type of disease treated locally are the respiratory disease. We observe a good proportion of plants used for the treatment of cough and asthma. Next, we are going to look into the other medical conditions, symptoms, which include mainly fatigue, undoubtedly due to physical work and lack of energetic nourishment, also bites from snakes and other insects. In view of this data, we can say that most of the illnesses treated are linked to a life of physical work in isolated villages. It also appears, and please do not be offended, but there is a preponderance of symptoms linked to alcoholism. Yes, I have observed that the Dusuns, uh, and I mean, historically, uh, please bear in mind that the collection of data starts from the 15th century up to today. So all of these data are during this time frame. Okay, uh, the Dusuns and Kalazans seem historically to have used a lot of plants for the, um, for the treatment of disease in related to alcoholism, such as um, liver problems and also pancreatitis and join this, and it is interesting because, because these plants could be used actually for the treatment of alcohol intoxication on global scales. You have plants here that can be manufactured and exported not only, I mean, the plants can be used locally for your own people, but you can make a lot of money by exporting plants. You, you have, you know, not only petrol, you have petrol, you know, in the east coast of Sabah. I don't know where the petrol in your country, but you also have right in front of your nose plants that can generate an enormous amount of wealth for the Sabah. But it seems to me that it's not being used. I don't know why. But I'm trying to stimulate you tonight. And to, you know, I'm not saying that you are not, stimul you are not stimulated yet, but I'm a Frenchman, so my English is not Oxfordian, okay? Um, so forgive sometimes, you know, my, my words might not be, you know, I wish I could give a class in French, but... <laughs> okay, so, in addition, it seems that cancers and cardiovascular diseases and obesity are not so common in rural areas. Maybe it has changed. Perhaps because these people are fleeing industrial foods and living far from pollution. Um, okay, you may say, look, 
this selection of Pelissa plants, but you are speaking about plants used by magic. You're right, but again, Atropa Belladonna and Digitalis Corporea used by magic in Europe are mothers of multi million US dollars uh, drugs. So I had to go into that. I was also able to note that around 20 plants species are used in particular by the Dusun and Lungus for magic rituals. I don't know anything about magic rituals, I don't want to know. I learned that the Dusun historically, yeah, 1922, okay, maybe it has changed. I don't want to offend local sensibility, okay, believed, okay, um, that illnesses come from evil spirits. Generally, the patient will consult an animist high priestess too soon, called a Bobolian. Yes. Yes. Okay. My kind of advice to you is that go and see them. Don't waste time because they're getting older. <laughs> no, you need to catch them, take a pen, and record everything, <laughs> and save all of that because it's too precious. They are the, the source, they are the pillars of Sabah culture. They are the most precious, you know, things now in terms of medicine. Um, maybe you can give them an allowance, or create a center for Oboyans, I don't know. Um, I've never met such people, I wish I could, but I don't know. Uh, so the Bobolian priest will come and do contact with the spirits, who will give her descriptions of the plan to be used and where and when to have them. It may sound, sorry to use that, plain but crazy, right? But I stop. I also work in the Philippines. And in the Philippines, believe me or not, some people are also like that. They will speak incantations, they will smoke something, whatever. They have a dream the day after they get the plan and they say the kid. I can't explain that. It's maybe it's telepathy, I don't know, but there is something like of paranormal activity, which is not the topic of this talk this evening. For instance, you can see here the leaves of this plant called Iqualia spinosa in the family Africaceae palm tree, and other plants of the genus Iqualia, including the Iqualia videntata, which are used for magic rituals by the Dusuns. It is called, I could be wrong, Silent. Is that correct? Yes. I went to some places and I saw that between Sidat you've got three months close. So that one I'm very scared, so I didn't stay very long. But just nice and goodbye, take my car. Um, yes, I, I respect the culture. I'm not I'm not I'm not contentious. I have a high respect for the culture, but when I see skulls I mean, in France, there is no skulls anymore right? in that home, you know, so... <laughs> so, no one has done any studies on that. There is no pharmacological studies. You see, also we've got here this plant, which is, according to Evans, and he too, was extremely feared by the Lucy. And the Moruts and the Lungus, when they saw that plant in the forest, they will say to their Tuan, okay, I read this time, don't go there, don't touch that plant because if you touch that plant, you're finished. Okay? Uh, this plant is Tabella Pantana Macrocarpa. Macrocarpa, I don't want to show off, but you know, species name as linked to Greek and Latin, macro being big, fruit Macrocarpa. Okay? And uh, it is called Lampada, is that correct? Thank you. And according to Dusun, there is the belief that the name of a local deity, Ken Haringan, is that correct? Placed a curse. Thank you. Placed a curse, I cite, huh? on anyone who violated a tree of this species. The punishment being that offenders will die of incredible ulcers. Okay. So, once again, this indigenous practice could be ridiculed. Some people could be contemptuous. 
this is their way, it's not my way. I learned to be humble. Um, in Asia, I have been working in the jungle for many years, and I have observed things which you can't explain. So, pharmaceutically speaking, you know, for instance, in some part of the world, I will just take one example, in Pakistan, okay? It's far away. But in Pakistan, this is someone, something I learned, I went for a conference one day. They used to have parts of the root of a plant from the family Valayanasi and hang them around the neck of epileptics. So you may say, this doesn't make sense, you're not going to treat epilepsy with that. No, no, no. It was discovered that these parts contain some volatile substances able to act on the brain gabayaji receptors and inhibit epilepsy. You see? Uh, therefore, ethnopharmacologists, uh, including the future ethnopharmacologists, hopefully, uh, need to be open minded and take note of local legends and rituals. Yeah, this is a, I like to make drawings of the plants I, I observe, you know. So this one is my, my So now let us look into the I hope I'm not too long, eh? If I'm too long I can speak faster. Mm -hmm. Is it okay the timing? Yeah. Oh, you want me to finish faster or are you okay? Are you feeling comfortable? Yeah, okay. 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 So I will okay. So concerning the association between medicinal plants and eating groups, we can divide the medicinal of Sabbath into two main categories. The first category includes the plant not used by any particular group. For instance, we've got the bajals, sulups, the iranum, and the uh, and the rungu. Some of them are using the same plant. But some ethnic groups use one plant. Endemic. This one is the bird. That one is the tiger. But I have to speak about this. First of all, this first group of plants used by particular ethics. We can have a small game together. We'll show you some photos and maybe you can. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, my dear, what's happened? It's, it's moving by itself. Oh, I'm sorry. So, I don't know how to. Okay. So, the first category, which are plants used by all the groups of Saba, are in general well known and often with their active principle identified. They are never on the to Saba. They originate from tropical Asian countries or even Africa or South America, which is okay. We can cite, for instance, Peter Betel or Betel Pepper here, okay, which is used for diabetes by the Bajals, Dusuns, and Kalazans. And we've got also here this uh, soap that is called in Bajau, this correct me, huh? um, this is from literature, um, uh, Nongla Belanda. I think that Belanda means. Durian Belanda. Durian Belanda. Durian Belanda. Oh, thank you very much. Durian Belanda. Dutch Durian. Which means. Belanda means Holland, right? Dutch. And speaking about toxicology, do you think this plant is safe to eat? Yes. Yes? No, it is not. Oh, no. We eat it all the time. No. And you will end up with Parkinson. Oh, because it contains some alkaloids which are attacking dopaminergic neurons. Of course, you need to eat a lot of it every day, okay? But I will not touch that. Okay. What about the leaves? All of them, all the parts. By the way, the leaves are used in the Philippines to treat fever in, in kids. Mother in low stone. It's a nice name. <laughs> okay. Uh, it is an ornamental plant, beautiful, but it's also a toxic. Uh, it's quite famous in this part of the world for kidney stones, but my kind of advice is don't touch that. Please don't put this in your mouth because it's not going to be good for your body. And you've got also this aloe vera. Oh, which is okay, but we are used by wolves, by badgers, bookies, tusun, kadazan, and rungus. Uh, in Bangladesh, they are, they are drinking the gel. Uh, it's quite a nice plant. 
actually, but it's well known, okay, you can't make business with that, it's everywhere, all over Aragel, uh, in all pharmacies. Uh, nice one, I like this one because it's for blood pressure, and I have a bit of blood pressure, it's normal, getting older, so no salt, and also sometimes a tea of this plant that will make your BP going from 150 to 112, and then so, Funella grass, which is used for flat finance by bad joke today and we do soon because it contains essential oils, you know, and it will make you know, okay, um, quite safe. Please add this if you have high blood pressure, do not hesitate to add this in your soups. Uh, it's a good plant, but it's well known, so you can't make anything with that. Uh, Elosin adica, which is called Indian post grass. <coughs> quite common in, in the lawns, in the garden, which is uh, used for calazan uh, and dusuns for flu and parts and postpartum. Beautiful plant here in Carapas in America called Paca in Dusun. Thank you very much. And used for fever by many people, you know, in this state. And you've got also this beautiful Setawa Haria. I don't know if I pronounce well, um, which is actually a plant used for asthma and respiratory problems by Dusun, Skalazan, Zunday, and Mood. In Peninsula, Malaysia, it is used for kidney stones and for magics, but it's not the of tonight. And you know what? No one knows what's inside it. Uh, okay, you know all about this, a kurkuma. Do you think that it's good to take kurkuma every day? No. Very good. Why? Because uh, antioxidants from the antioxidant per, uh, perspective, Please. you put antioxidants, no. your body actually generates antioxidants as much as it's needed. Yes. Unless it's in a wounded state or something like that. You constantly add and add and your body will not produce itself. Correct. And also, when you, your body, we oxidate. That's why you take taking oxygen to the air. And you're actually stopping it. Well, not exactly stopping it, but it lowers your oxygenation, and it's not your homeostasis of the of the antioxidants would not uh, yes. would not function properly after that. You got a very good point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Also, do you know that taking too much of can make you bleed? Hemorrhages. Yeah, but you find this in capsules in pharmacy shop, right? Yes. yes. But how could it be the meat? You know why? Because they're not teaching anymore medicinal plants in terms of pharmacy and not medicine. And almost anyone can say anything nowadays. And to be frank with you, I would advise you to listen to Boboyan, number one, and not to Watson's and other things. Go and meet the blood practitioners. But I think it's good for skin diseases. A small amount, very small amount. Mm. Then we've got also this philanthus in Brai, oh, also a traditional Chinese medicine for liver detoxification, okay. for blood pressure by Kedayan, Kusun, and Kalazan. Please bear in mind that I am not making here any claims tonight. Okay, so please don't go home and take the plant and you will seek any send me to court. <laughs> I am declaring that I am not making any sanitary claim. Okay, but I know that it is used for uh, hypertension in the family for BSC. You got here Calica papaya. Okay, and you know what? It is used for hypertension by a lot of people in this state. Also, we have this uh, a beautiful psidium oh, wow. guayava used for indigestion. <laughs> in the Philippines, people in Mindanao were using it for as a toothpaste, and it works in for wounds. Um, also, oh, that one. Is it nice to make that one? No, no, it's not. It's I can spend it. Can spend it. <laughs> but, but, What's inside the food that is poisonous? Yes. Especially if you've got kidney mm -hmm. You know what? It's full of potassium. Mm -hmm. 
And if you have kidney failure, you cannot exclude potassium. And you know what's happening when your potassium is too high? You die of heart attack. God forbid. So people have died with this already. I was told by a good friend that was medical officer that some people have died by taking this plant. Excessive. So, but your friend, thank you. Avoid that. Okay. Uh, then one of my favorites. You see, you said. I want to attract your attention on something very interesting called the theory of signature. When you see this stamen, what do you think about? Yeah. Then or so, does it look like something like water coming out? Yeah. A jet of water? Yeah. And it is a fantastic theory. This is known from, I've read some books written by some Dutch explorers in the 18th century, uh, speaking about this plant from Java, already used for no high blood pressure. The chemistry is known and products are being produced. And also we've got this Bumia uh, Bazumifera, which is quite, which is not... Yes, one of my dear friends, uh, Dr. Ponegia Imemes, which is an anthropologist, told me that this plant is used in the northern islands of Sava. You know, I've seen some uh, ladies giving birth in videos, you know. Yes, and then the traditional dealers we put plenty of that plant below the house, the steel, you know, the, the house on the steel, right? And of course, when they give birth, there's a lot of blood and juice, whatever, if we fall down on the, I'm sorry, I mean that, the excretions, okay, uh, waters, and so they believe that by recollecting these liquids by the plant and later on doing some things, okay, so this is a very famous uh, plant um, in uh, Sava. And also, we've got this one here, Sida Bonifolia. You can shoot for fever. And you've got also this Naraya, which is used for boils. This plant is actually not from Asia. Um, and you've got our beautiful coconut. And once again, coconut water contains a lot of potassium. So if you have kidney failures or any diabetic conditions or heart conditions, Speak to the doctor first because it might not be good for you. Okay. Right? How is this supposed to cure smallpox? I have no idea, and you know what? No one knows because there is no study in that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we've got here this uh, what you call jarak, uh, which is a poisonous plant, uh, which is used for a uh, lot of conditions. Now, when we go into the uh, plant use specifically by some ethnic groups in Sava, uh, I really had to understand what are the main locality groups. And I read a book in the book, it's a American British uh, Borneo, written by uh, the British historian Edward Owen Rutter. He served in North Borneo civil service from 1910 to 1915. And I learned a lot uh, by reading this excellent this fine educated gentleman from England that we are serving in North Borneo. Um, now, also, I read a paper published by uh, Professor Paul Kroger from Dallas International University, published in 1986. It is not possible for me to define what is a Dusun or Ungus or Mugut, and I only could do it by language, according to the language used. And I read this paper, excellent paper, and we classify the ethnic groups according to their um, language. We can observe that uh, most of the plant used specifically by one type of group is known by the Dusun. The Dusunic family, uh, which uh, actually is followed by the Morotic family, um, the Lundayes, which are uh, in fact part of the Western Austronesian superstock, followed by the Bajau and the Malay family. We'll come back later into each of them. The Dusunic family uh, comprise several groups of which the Dusun, Galazan, and Lungus. Uh, and according to published literature, I don't make any claims, I don't want to offend anyone, but it is said that Galazan and Dusuns were among the first inhabitants of Sama. I do not be thrown out. You know better than me, but that's what they say. And you can see that there are also those having the most endemic plant proper to their own tribes. Uh, 
these uh, plant use biodiversities uh, are actually uh, actually 34 in number, most of them non endemic except in Okra Tricogona here, which is called Burubadan or Bamboo Wadan. Forgive my um, lack of accuracy in pronouncing this. As you can see, pharmacology and phytochemistry are unknown, which means that not a single scientist has studied the chemical constituents or the therapeutic effect of this. And in fact, I will tell you that most of your plants are not studied. You know, you need to say that you have plants growing around you and use in the villages, but no one has ever tested them for HIV AIDS or cancer or diabetes in a lab. Perhaps we start because we can't wait. You know? um, so we've got here this plant which is Etlangera brevilla prom called Sibu in uh, Dushun. Um, beautiful plant in the family Etlangera C. We also have Nucleia gigantea uh, next, which is here, which is called Mahipap, which is used for diarrhea and trash. Um, and there, there is one paper published by some Malaysian scientists showing that yes, the extract is able to work in trash. Okay. Uh, this plant is also uh, no, that's all. Okay. It's type 43. We've got here. This is my own. I like to make drawings. All of these drawings take each drawing takes me three days. <laughs> uh, yeah, you've got to really love your, your science, you know. So I stay in the library and I make my drawings, you know. Uh, I've all throughout my life, I have drawn perhaps, let's say, 120 botanical plates. But I'm not one to boast and I keep them in my office and I don't intend to, you know. It's already the book. Um, it is called Pohum Pong Bukit. I don't know if I'm uh, okay. Use for a deck. Interesting, it is in the Psychotria genus in the family Rubiaceae, which is also a, in the same genus as another Psychotria, which is home to a um, reserpine, uh, which is uh, uh, used for blood pressure. Reserpine from a plant from India. No one has studied that plant. You may have a drug inside it. But I have the gut feeling, sorry, to sound a bit negative that. Deforestation, if, if nothing is done, may vanish that. And with it, you know, I mean, it is possible to say that the deciders, we understand that you want to make money with timbers. It's your country, you do what you want, okay? But you will make more money with drugs. More money with drugs. Billions of I mean, drugs, medicines. Okay. French, okay, medicine, okay, right? Yeah. By, by patenting, by patenting a molecule, you can generate billion of US dollars, more than cutting a forest. Okay. So we've got also after this uh, Cesaria in Rigulosa uh, Lupor, King Lupor in Dusun, not known. And we've got Nephilium macrophyllum, which is in the, no, Memicillum scopolacinum, which is nothing else about this plant. It may even have disappeared already. You can see it is a very old biome here. <coughs> okay. And we've got here this uh, in the family of your rambutan, another species, uh, which is used for magic by the Dusuns. Um, okay. Um, now, we are going next to some plants used by the, for magic rituals by the Pusun, like Encruave, okay, Xanthophyllum reticulatum, they contain drugs, as well as Sina, uh, Microcos sinanomifolia, right? Call, uh, I, mean, I don't want to give the names, I don't know, okay, but this plant has not been studied. Let us go now into the Rungus which are, as you can see, part of the Dusunic family. You've got here, within the word Dusunic family, you've got the Rungus, you've got the Kadazans, and many other ethnic groups. The 
the uh, okay the Rungus live on the north coast of Sabah uh, are often okay are using plants which are found in swamps, swamp forests and river banks and mangroves. Some of them known, such as what you call bakau. Alright? Uh, also you've got uh, Microcos and Vitamis folia, as well as Elocarpus clementis. Again, pharmacology and phytochemistry unknown, and Ixora, uh, sorry, uh, capillaris. Nothing known about this plant. Then we've got, we've got regarding the plants used by the Morbutic family. So you've got your multi family with all of these various tribes. According to this paper published in 1984, it seems that multi people are living. You can correct me, okay? I'm not an anthropologist. I may say something wrong for that, you know? Seems to live in this part of Sabah. And uh, the uh, interesting point about the world is that they use them to poison the darts of their blogans. And there is a case, which is a sad case. Um, okay, so I'm page 55. Oh my dear, what's happened? Okay, so that one is the, again with this uh, Morut. Okay, so this one is um, endemic, uh, used by the Morut. Also that one here, and that one as well. And also this beautiful Apocarpus Tamaran in the Morase family. Nothing is known about this. Now to go back to the blogger, this gentleman here, uh, is a, a German geologist, Mr. Francis Xavier Witty, which succumbed uh, to an attack by the boat, uh, I think in the year 1892, in some rivers. He got a blogger and then died. Tried to shoot a few bullets first, but I can tell you that his death has been very unpleasant. Uh, this type of poisons are going in horrible, painful, dreadful death. Okay? Um, uh, it is possible that the poison used may have been uh, the Deroxylon uh, in the family of Lorassé, found in Borneo and Sumatra. By the way, the active toxic constituents of these plants are unknown. And you know what is interesting with Blogan dart is that these poisons always contain substances interfering with the neuromuscular system. Some blood dart poisons from South America have allowed the discovery of drugs used for myasthenia gravis and other degenerative diseases. And no one here has ever studied this plant yet. But you've got so many universities and researchers around. So what's happening? I don't know. It is matter to think. Um, and let's go now to the Western Austronesian stock, um, which includes the Lundaye people, which in 1986, it seems we are living in the west of uh, uh, the Sabah, use about 16 plants, all non endemic except the Kalzura Bonensis that you have here for the Suluks, uh, sorry, the Suluk or Tosuk family, there is one plant but it's not from Sabah, it's not endemic. The Sungay people living mainly in the East Coast rivers as well as the Iranum do not appear to use any specific plant as well. The Bajau people um, are actually using 15 plants, none of them but what is interesting is that many of these plants are growing on the seaside. I suspect that the Bajau historically were in the sea, right? Seafarers, if I'm not. Okay. And we can see, for instance, that one, which is called Red Teruntum, used by the Bajau. Okay, a little bit of study, but not too much. As well as this beautiful here, Avicenia marina, used by for the stingray by the Bajaus. And we've got also uh, this Soniratia alba, in Latin alba means white, 
you can see the flowers are pure white use for uh, diarrhea and fever because this plant is astringent, meaning that it contains lots of tannins. And you also have the Lucacus granatum, magnificent tree with beautiful uh, fruits. And um, we can go now into uh, the uh, Kedayan people, which I was told I could be wrong, are descendants of a people from uh, Indonesia, uh, Java, coming to Brunei. Okay, I could be wrong, but the, they are in the Malayic family. Okay, um, and the Malayic family also comprise. Uh, the Ibans and the Cocos Malays located in Tawao and Lahadet. The Kedayan are using 11 plants, of which it seems it is said Coyotalamus roseus, but I doubt. I don't think so. It is a plant really from the core of the rainforest and it can't be used for people which are descendant of Sumatra. I think they are, this plant is being used by Ibans. We still have Ibans in Sabah. Um, and actually, this plant is like many other plants in the genus Gunotelamus, used for magics. You can, I will not teach you that because you are Sabahans, but they are deep selling some, you know, uh, some sort of piece of wood, right? And they say that it's for protection, and most of them are coming from this Gunotelamus. We also have um, the Austronesian stock, the Javanese, one plant, and the Tindong family. In the Pornian stock, there is no specific plants. I was working before in the University of Nottingham in uh, Malaysia, and I had a very good Chinese friend, Sabah Chinese, and it was during the COVID-19 pandemics. And believe me or not, but she told me that in her family, they are using this plant here. Okay, mm -hmm. the name here is Empedu Pumi. Okay, I don't know what does it mean. But I actually used that plant during the COVID pandemic. Uh, I was positive and it helped me. Okay, um, I'll get an injection after that. Okay, uh, uh, this plant is used in Peninsula Malaysia for diabetes. It is well known. Okay, now we spoke at the beginning of this class about this lecture about the right pandemics. If you had during COVID-19 time an organization in Sala or an institution dedicated to the study of medicinal plants with already some small products or small research, you, your state government could call them and say, we've got COVID now, what can we use? If we've got that one, okay, we try, we give it to the population. You could have saved lives. Mm -hmm. um, so, this is this beautiful, but it's known the family of Side effects, I will try perhaps to. As you can see, we can see here that, again, for instance, for those of you who have dogs, do you know that to give chocolates to dogs can kill them? Yes. And it's a plant, it's a medicinal plant, right? The warm cacao. We don't know this. Is it safe to take some pumpkin seeds? Especially for elderly man, you know, we tend to have prostate enlargement and we are told to take pumpkin seeds. But again, it contains too much potassium. And if you take too much pumpkin seeds, and if you have kinephalus, then you will be in danger. So, medicinal plants, actually can be toxic and we can see that for most of the medicinal plants of Saba there is nothing about toxicity and sometimes some of these plants are in the market ouch okay now I might perhaps do not become unpopular but it's okay you're not the first one but I will stand for truth and do you know who is this guy? Yes. <laughs> and is it good for health? So they say. Okay. Half truth. I know that in Peninsula Malaysia, the Malays used to take a bit of food 
in water and once a month or once every few months to get to be strong. <laughs> but nowadays you got tap shoes, coffees, which sometimes don't even contain the plant. <laughs> because they're not controlled by a pharmacist. Mm -hmm. If an herbal remedy is I don't speak about traditional Chinese medicine, they have their own system, we've got the shops. I don't touch that, they have their own knowledge and it's good. Okay. But if an herbal remedy is not in the hand of a pharmacist, it's not safe. Okay. Now, I have found some publications on Google. You don't trust me, it's okay. You go to Google Scholar, you type the recommend trifolia, rats, and you will see some papers saying that. If you give too much of these to rats, they will end up with prostate cancer. Ouch. Okay? So, okay. Uh, that one, you know it? It is in, sold in the market. I think you call it Sayomanis? Yeah. Oh. Oh. And you please stop eating that. Because it's going to destroy your lungs. And if you don't trust me, you can. But go to Google Scholar and you will see the publications telling you that you will end up with lung problems. <coughs> then our monitor, this one is what you call your putri malu, which is very toxic also. It contains... So, you see, the science of medicinal plant doesn't only encompass botany and pharmacology, but also toxicology. But who is teaching toxicology of medicinal plants nowadays in universities? One. So what's happening? Now, let us go into future prospect. About 88% of the, of the plants that I have met, only 535, okay, have not been studied. But in fact, I suspect that you've got a thousand species here, not studied. If you have a gold mine, if you have diamonds, if you have uranium, in Sabah, you'll be happy because you are going to get more money for the state. I am telling you, my friends, you've got better than uranium in Sabah. Mm -hmm. This summit is not bad. And you can generate a lot of money for the state in the Sabah. Mm -hmm. If 88% of these plants are not studies, the probability to find the jackpot molecule is there. But if you don't want to study, Okay. okay. Now I will end up this lecture with uh, some uh, um, so quick. Uh, I'm sorry. I apologize for the long, but I enjoy speaking to you tonight. It's good for me to leave my library and my book to see some human beings sometimes. <laughs> you can see that uh, out of about 535 plants used for medicine seeds in Sabah. And I have actually the gut feeling that the exact number is much higher. A total of 62 plant species have been at least preliminary tested for their pharmacological properties, known for cosmetics. You can make cosmetics. Known for veterinary uses. We can say that the bulk of the work remains to be done. As for what could be done, these are my humble suggestions. I'm a foreigner, I'm the one to tell you what to do. But I like Sabah, and I like Sabah. I'm not a parasite. Okay? I want to share. If you don't like what they say, it's okay. <coughs> but I care, and I will tell you what you could perhaps do. Firstly, I beg you to create a state research center solely dedicated to pharmaceutical, nutraceutical, cosmetic, and veterinary development of the medicine of Sabah. Secondly, we have to train local students in research in the field of medicinal plants. And this can be done by pharmacists or researchers with track records of academic knowledge and publication in the field. You need to build solid local expertise. How lucky is Sabah to have such a beautiful university like UNS? And how I would like to see more local people there fully trained 
in medicinal practice. Thirdly, there is the urgent need to preserve the environment, the rainforest. You know what? Some people say, okay, we can cut the rainforest and we can replant it. No, it's a sham. You cannot. It took millions of years to grow and to form itself. This is unique. Some people say, yeah, but you white man, you know, uh, your country before was full of oaks and pine trees and forests and you cut it all. But it is not because we have seen and made this mistake that you have to do the same mistake. Um, I heard from my, one of my colleagues in UMS, my dear friend Dr. Polinia, that sometimes villagers are not able to enter their own forest because they are under reserve state. And I beg you to allow them to go and get their roots because if you don't allow them to go to the forest, they will lose their knowledge. Um, also, Saba has so much to offer to the world in terms of herbal remedies and their discovery. Keep in mind that it is possible to make more money from discovering a medicine from Saba's primary rainforestry or a medicinal plant billion of US dollars than from cutting and selling timbers. You know, it's like you've got a bank and then you go in the bank and you burn and you cut. You burn the cash. This, you know, not all diseases are known. I bet you, you wait a bit. New diseases are coming. Where are we going to get the drugs from? They are in the trees now. If you get the trees, then where you get the plants, the, the, the drugs from? In conclusion, the medicinal flora of Saba is a unique and fantastic source of plants with the potential to be developed into medicines, over-the-counter medicines, herbal remedies, cosmetics, dietetic products, and dietary medicine for the health benefit of not only Saba, but the entire world. It seems to me that the medicinal flora of Saba is richer and higher in terms of pharmaceutical potentials than Sarawak, Brunei, or Peninsula Malaysia. So I still have many pages, but I don't want you to go back home too late. Okay? Uh, I will just tell you that last point is that in Sarawak, you see, when you don't have local expertise, you are going to call people from overseas. In Sarawak, for instance, they have called people from Europe to help them to develop their own medicine. And it costs millions of ringgit from tax spending. And nothing came out of it. Use that money for your own state. And form, train your own students. Mm. Yes. No? Millions of ringgit. In university, now we have no grants. Okay? I don't have grants. I don't even have a lab. I have nothing. Just a table and my brain. Okay? And if you use a few million ringgits in the rents. We can do wonders. Can I got goosebumps? I know. I know all those plants when I work in the garden in the park. I know their name in the species name. I know they are waiting for us. No. I truly enjoy writing this book. I love my work. And I really appreciate it and value the fascinating local knowledge. As a foreign researcher, I do not have all the connections I would like to in order to continue my research in the field of drug discovery from the medicine of Sabah. We have so much work to do. Thank you very much.